year or more to determine if there are any long lasting deleterious consequences of the infection. We just don't know that now. We haven't had enough time. Okay. Um, you made a comment recently comparing the severity of COVID uh, to the 1918 pandemic. Um, can you say more about that? Yeah, I, I'm glad you, you brought that up because I want to clarify that. I had used the word comparable, and I think that may have been taken out of context because people would have thought, my goodness, we're having this now. Is it going to be the 50 to 100 million people in 1918 that thought, no, they're not comparable in that way at all in severity. They're very, very different. I was just talking about 102 years then, we're historically now looking at a historically important outbreak because we haven't had anything like this really for 102 years. But I don't want anybody to think this severity comparability because of what was experienced in 1918, which just, I mean, if you look at it, it was 50 to 100 million deaths in a population one third the size now. So I wanted to clarify that. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. This is a serious situation we're facing now, but it's not 1918. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, now, a lot of the comments that people have written in are about asking about reopening schools, right? So how should we be thinking about reopening schools? Uh, what does the science tell us on this issue? What is your view of the appropriate threshold in terms of deciding when to reopen? And a lot of parents just want to know how they uh, personally should be thinking about this. So I'd, I'd love to hear you talk about that, that set of sure. issues. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Mark. A, a great question because it's something that we're addressing now as we're into the summer and getting ready to opening the schools. So I think as a default, I, I have a general concept and then I'll fill in the blanks. The general concept is that to the extent possible, our default should be to try and get the children back to school. The reason I say that is that the unintended ripple effects, downstream consequences of keeping the children out of school can be profound. The American Academy of Pediatrics has spoken about that, the deleterious effects on children. The impact on parents who have to modify their work schedule if their children stay home. There are a lot of unintended negative consequences. Having said that, with the thought that the default should be to try and get kids to school, you've got to look at where you are location-wise. Because as I've said often, the United States is a large country, geographically and demographically quite different and varied. You could be in a part of the country, a county, a city, a state, in which the level of virus infection, the dynamics is so low, you could send kids back to school without any modification or any worry. But there are also some areas when you look in the dynamics of the infection are so intense, you have to say, wait a minute, let me think about it. Do I have to close the school for now? Or can I go back, but in order to be safe, do I need to do it in a modified way? Alternate days, morning, afternoon, or whatever, because paramount to drive it is the safety and the health of the children as well as the safety and health of the teachers. So you've really got to make sure that's a driving force in your decision. So a wide degree of variability, default, always try to get the schools open. If you can't do it in a natural way, do a modification. Some of the, the school principals and the superintendents have very creative ways of doing that, of modifying the class structure, outdoors maybe a little bit more, protecting the vulnerable, it can be done. It can be done. Okay. And is there anything else that you'd say to parents who are worried about um, e either having schools reopen or the safety of sending their kids to schools? Yeah, I mean, I think they have to, I mean, and I know parents, at least I as a parent, when my children were at that age, I certainly would be concerned, is to listen to the recommendations. You know, the CDC has guidelines, the health officials locally, will make a decision, hopefully, and I, I cannot imagine they won't, based on a concern for the safety at the same time as the need to get the children back to school. CDC guidelines are there. They can be used very well. Yeah. So I want to talk about um, the racial disparities here, which I think are really 
troubling. Um, the CDC has reported that Black, Latinx, and Native Americans are four times as likely to be infected with COVID um, and twice as likely to die as white Americans. So um, what can you tell us about what we're seeing here and um, and, and what is being done by, by the government to, to address this? Yeah, that, that's a, a, a very good question, Mark, and a very disturbing phenomenon that is a reality. And, and, and there's an explanation for it, and there are things that we can do about it immediately, but things that are going to take decades for us to correct. So if you look at the fact that if you look at minorities, as you mentioned, African Americans, Latinx, Native, Native Americans, and Alaskan Americans, if you look at that group, although you don't like to generalize, but it is a fact that as a demographic group, the kinds of jobs that they generally have do not allow them as much to do the kind of telecommunication that we're doing right now that put them in so-called essential jobs where they're outside in a situation exposed enough to have a greater incidence of infection than someone who could call a timeout and do work from the quiet and solitude of their own home. So they have a greater chance of getting infected. Once they do get infected, as a group, if you look at the underlying conditions that lead to a higher likelihood of a bad outcome, those demographic minority groups have a much higher incidence of that. And I'm talking about hypertension, obesity, cardiovascular disease, uh, other types of chronic lung disease, diabetes. Those are the things that put you at a higher risk. So the immediate things that we can do now is that, how do you address that? What you do is you put resources where you have a demographic concentration of individuals so they can get tested easily, contact traced easily, have access to care, get under the care of a healthcare provider quickly to try and mitigate the advancement of disease. You can do that right away. We can concentrate resources in those places making sure they get things that they need right away. The broader picture of the social determinants of health that lead to minority groups having a higher incidence of diabetes, of obesity, of lung disease, of heart disease, those are the kind of things that we as a society need to address and commit to doing over a period of decades, because that's not gonna change overnight. But let's at least do the things that we can fix now. And we could fix access to care, we could fix ease of testing, we could do that now. Yeah, okay, that, that's, that's important and, and I think it makes sense. Um, I wanna make sure we have time to discuss some of the science and potential treatments. Um, you know, earlier on, I, I know that a lot of scientists were hopeful that there might be existing drugs, um, including uh, things like hydroxychloroquine that might have been effective against COVID, but unfortunately, um, it seems like nothing has really emerged as a as a uh, clear treatment of of existing uh, drugs that were already on the market and and had already been uh, reviewed as safe. And even drugs like remdesivir, um, which is 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 probably one of the more uh, effective newer medications, doesn't seem to have as huge of a positive impact as we might have hoped. Um, so what's your take on the drugs that we've found so far, that we've tested? Um, and are there any treatments that you're optimistic about uh, over the coming months? Uh, good. Okay, great question. Thanks, Mark. So if you look at advanced disease and early disease, we have had two advances. And, and this was in a randomized placebo-controlled trial, not those other types of anecdotal things which give you information that generally confuses people. If you look at remdesivir in individuals who are hospitalized with lung involvement and you look at the impact of remdesivir, there was a highly significant but modest effect in diminishing the time to recovery. So that's one well-proven good drug. Dexamethasone, which is a glucocorticoid, an anti-inflammatory steroid, clearly showed in hospitalized patients on ventilators or requiring oxygen, but not people with early disease, that if you gave it six milligrams a day for up to 10 days, 
you significantly diminished the death rate in ventilated patients, in patients requiring oxygen, but not in early patients, which is interesting because it goes along with the, what we know of the pathogenesis of the disease, that when you have early disease, you want to block the virus and keep the immune system revved up and working. When you have late disease, it's less the virus doing damage than the aberrant inflammatory response, which is the reason why dexamethasone works. So we have two good things going. What we really need is your question about what do we have in the mix right now? What we really need are drugs that when given early can prevent a symptomatic person from requiring hospitalization or very dramatically diminish the time that they're symptomatic. And some of the promising ones are other direct antiviral drugs, which we're screening and targeting. Also, convalescent plasma, which we're doing a trial to see if it works, hyperimmune globulin, and importantly, monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies are very precise bullets that you have by developing from a person who's been infected or vaccinated, making antibodies, clone their B cells, and give it to people early on. You can do it as an outpatient. You can do it as an inpatient. All of those things are being geared up now and are either in clinical trial or will soon be going into clinical trial. So when you talk about things like monoclonal antibodies, how, how would that be administered and who could get that? Who, 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 who is the audience that that might be helpful for? Yeah, well, the, the, first of all, it can be administered intravenously. Once you get the right titration, you can do that subcutaneously or intramuscularly. It's for, you can do it for two things, Mark. Excuse me? Through a shot. Uh, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, through a shot. Yeah, e either right through the vein or just like you get a gamma globulin shot. You could do it that way. Now, that can be done either for prophylaxis or for treatment. So for example, if you're in a situation where you have a nursing home situation where there's an outbreak and you wanna prevent people from getting ill, you can just do it that way. Or after a person is infected, you can give it to them as a treatment. This was very successfully done in a randomized placebo controlled trial. It wasn't a placebo, it, it was a drug that was serving as the control. You might remember Mark of Ebola in West Africa mm -hmm where we showed that two types of different monoclonal antibodies were very effective in Ebola. And we hope we're gonna see the same thing now with COVID. And what do you think the time frame for something like that might be? Well, the trials have already started, Mark. I would hope that as we get to the late summer and early fall, we'd be able to have enough efficacy data. Because remember, whenever you do this, they may look promising in an animal model. You always got to be concerned about safety and you got to be concerned about, are you really giving someone something that works? So the clinical trials are underway for some and will soon start in another. I hope by the end of the summer, we'll have enough information as we get into the fall that we might be able to utilize these. It'll be really good if we have bookends, drugs for advanced disease and drugs for early disease to prevent advanced disease. Yeah, got it. That makes sense. And, and if that's coming over the next few months, I mean, that, that, um, uh, that, that's a good cause for some optimism. Um, yeah, yeah. Longer term, of course, developing a, a vaccine is going to be uh, critical. So um, I'm hoping that you can talk a bit through where we are um, in that process at, at this point um, and uh, what the process from getting from where we are now is to having a vaccine that could uh, be given to people broadly, and when the soonest uh, would be that that kind of a vaccine might be available. Yeah, yeah, um, I'm, I'm actually cautiously optimistic about this, Mark, because of what we've seen. As you probably know, given the technologies we have and the different platforms, we moved from the literally the day that that sequence was put on a public database to getting that sequence, pulling the gene and sticking it into a platform to make a vaccine was measured in days. And then 62 days later, we were in a phase one trial. So where are we right now? There are multiple candidates, not only one. So I might talk as the prototype of one, but there are more than one that will be going into advanced trials sort of in tandem sequentially. 
One right now that two days ago, it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the phase one data, which we did some time ago for safety and to see what kind of response it was induced. The thing that makes me optimistic about this whole enterprise is that this vaccine, which was an mRNA vaccine for Moderna that was developed here at the NIH, but as I mentioned, it's not the only one. That induced in the people who were in the phase one trial levels of neutralizing antibodies, which are the antibodies that are the real bullets to stop the virus. That is the gold standard of protection, is neutralizing antibodies. It induced it at levels, at a moderate dose of the vaccine, that were as high or higher than what you see with convalescent plasma after natural infection. And one of the hallmarks of vaccinology is when you get a vaccine, you'd like it to induce a response that's at least as good as natural infection, which would predict that the vaccine would likely be successful, even though the proof of the pudding is always you got to do the big efficacy trial for safety and for efficacy. At the end of this month, July, we're going to be starting the phase three trial of this candidate. And as we get into the summer, a month later, another candidate will go into phase three trial. And then a month later, another. So that over the next four to five months, you're going to see sequentially these candidates going into clinical trial. Having said that, if everything works out the way we hope and we don't get any unpredictable potholes and bumps in the road, we should know as we get into the mid to late fall, early winter, but probably late fall, whether we have candidates that really are safe and effective. And I hope and anticipate that we will have one or more. If that's the case, by the time we get to the end of this year, the beginning of calendar year 2021, we may have vaccine one or more candidate that is actually safe and effective. That being the case, we can start distributing doses widely at that time. And the reason why I think we can do it is that even as we're doing the clinical trials now, we, we being the enterprise, the companies, are going to already start making doses at risk, which means they're going to make doses even before they know the vaccine works, which means if it works, they've saved months. If it doesn't work, we've lost a lot of money. But we figure it's worth the risk. So the risk is not in safety, and the risk is not in scientific integrity. The risk is financially to try and make these steps truncated. So that's where I think we are. So I'm really quite cautiously optimistic that we'll be able to have something as we get into the end of this year and the beginning of next year. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, that's a good note of optimism. I think it might be useful to talk through um, the process of, of vetting a vaccine, both so that people have some sense of what it takes to get from an initial um, candidate to um, to, to something that's ready to go. Um, but also sure. because, you know, while I know that the vast majority of, of people would be very um, excited and optimistic if they could get a vaccine um, that would, that would um, prevent them from getting COVID today, um, I, I know that there are some people, it's, it's a fringe, but it's unfortunate, um, who, who, who um, question the, the overwhelming um, scientific evidence on the safety of, of, of um, uh, of these. So I, I just think going through the process and, and showing how overwhelmingly focused it is on making sure that these vaccines um, are safe would, would be helpful to go through as well. Sure. Uh, very good. I'll, I'll do it succinctly. Well, you get a candidate like the one we did. You, you, you get it, you put it in the form to be administered, and you put it through animal studies, animal tox studies, animal effective uh, efficacy studies. So it, before you even think about going into a phase one in humans, you got to have, is there a reason to believe that this is going to induce a response? You got to see it induced in an animal before you see it induced in a human. And does it protect in disease in an animal? Then you get that candidate and you go into phase one. Very limited number of people. Our phase one had 45 people, 15 at each dose. You want to see, is there any immediate safety signals? 
and you want to see if it induces the kind of response that you would predict would be protected. Then you go to the next phase. So if phase one is 45 people, phase two is hundreds of people. You get there, you continue safety, you continue immunogenicity. If it looks good, you then move to phase three. Phase three goes from hundreds of people to thousands of people. The trial we're going to start at the end of July is going to involve 30,000 people. So when you have that many people in a trial, not only are you looking to see if it works, but you're constantly keeping your eye on safety to make sure that a vaccine actually doesn't enhance disease and make people work. Once you do that, at every given point in the trial, an independent group called the Data and Safety Monitoring Board looks at the data and says, trial's going okay, you can continue. Looks next month or the month later, trial's going okay, you continue. Or, wait a minute, it looks like you're never gonna really get an answer because nothing looks like it's working. You have futility, stop the trial. Or what we're hoping for, Mark, that they look at the data and say, wow, this looks good enough that ethically you can't continue with a placebo. You've got to say this works, let's start distributing it. Those are the individual steps of developing a vaccine. Okay, that's, um, that's very helpful to go through. Um, while we're on kind of the ba basic safety measures for some of the um, common sense things that we're, that we're hoping to roll out. Um, I have a question here um, asking if there are any known adverse effects about wearing a mask at all. You know, I mean, there are some memes that, that go around around, um, you know, are people breathing in more carbon dioxide? Are there any issues like that? Um, from all of the studies around this, has anything negative been found? No, not at all, Mark. There has not been any indication that putting a mask on and wearing a mask for a considerable period of time has any deleterious effects on oxygen exchange or anything like that. Not at all. Yeah, and, and my understanding is this has also been studied even in people when they're running and exercising and things like that. And and, and I, I haven't seen anything that suggests that there would be any issue, no. but I mean, you, you obviously are the expert on this. Well, no, I mean, I mean, I wear a mask when I'm outside all the time, um, particularly making sure that I don't remove it when I'm close to people. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't bother me. I'm, I even run with a mask on. Uh, sometimes it gets a little moist there, <laughs> depending on the cloth that you're wearing. But uh, th there's nothing to indicate that wearing a mask has deleterious effects. Okay. Well, it's good to, to just get a chance to, to make sure that that is crystal clear for everyone. Um, and just reading a few more questions from, from the thread here, um, you know, one that, that has come up a bunch is, um, you know, some people are wondering, if someone isn't showing symptoms, um, then how is it that they could be contagious? Um, I mean, I, I kind of get why that might, why that might not be obvious to, to a lot of folks. So it's probably worth just taking a few minutes to talk through that and how that works. No, uh, that, that's a great question, Mark. I'm glad you asked it. Yes, and the reason you can be contagious, if you look at how you transmit from one person to another. The virus resides in the nasopharynx in the back of the throat. So that's the reason why when you say when you speak or cough or sing, the virus in droplets comes out. You may not see it, but when you do certain lightings and lasers, you can see it. What we have found out that when you measure the level of virus in the nasopharynx of asymptomatic people compared to people who are symptomatic, there doesn't seem to be any difference, which means there's as, as much virus in the nose of a person who's asymptomatic as there is in a symptomatic person, which means it is very, very likely that when that person talks or, or, or uh, sneezes or whatever, that enough virus will come out to infect someone else. So there is not a lot of difference in virus load, even though people can be very different with regard to their symptoms. Yeah, so related to your, your point about droplets, there's a, um, you know, some recent pieces that I've seen suggesting that, uh, or, or wondering whether to the extent to which this is aerosol or droplet. 
Um, there's a question from the thread about, do we have any data on how this moves around differently inside versus outside, um, or how long this can linger in the air for? Yeah, okay, so the linger in the air question relates to whether or not it's aerosolized or another word people use is airborne. So there are different types of droplets. So most of the droplets, when people speak and you see that little spray come out, are greater than five micrometers. Those are the kind that they're heavy enough, Mark, they don't go any more than three feet at the most six feet, which is why we say when you're outside, stay at least six feet apart from someone. There are other droplets that are less than five micrometers. Those are the ones that can, quote, aerosolize. And aerosolize means instead of coming out from your mouth and dropping within three to six feet, it can kind of float around the air and stay in the air for a period of time. Right now, it is unclear, and it is because we don't have enough data, that there is likely some aerosol that comes out, and you could show that by these lasers and lights. We don't know the extent to which aerosolized or virus that stays in the air for a long period of time is involved in the transmission. We certainly would like to know that, but it's very difficult to determine that, even though we know that some degree of aerosolization does occur. If you turn back the clock, and go to SARS back in 2002 and 2003, there was a clear cut instance in a Hong Kong hotel where aerosolization absolutely occurred, spread through different floors and infected individuals. Why that person who was the source of the aerosolized or whatever the source was, we still haven't figured out, but that was a good example of a coronavirus spreading through aerosol. But right now, today, well, I can't tell you with scientific certitude what proportion is spread through aerosol. That's one of the unknowns we're just going to have to work out. Got it. Okay. Um, maybe go back to vaccines for, for, um, for one more minute. I mean, we're, we're trying some, um, some novel strategies um, with some of these vaccines like the RNA vaccine. I think it, it, the Moderna um, candidate might be an RNA vaccine. And I, I'm not sure if there are any, um, th this might be the first kind of major RNA vaccine. So I'm curious to just hear you talk about the advantages and, um, and disadvantages of the different strategies for types of vaccines that can get developed. And maybe even beyond COVID, um, if an RNA vaccine ends up being um, possible and working, what are some of the advantages for treating future outbreaks and things like that in the future? Yeah, G good question. So there are multiple, we, we, we refer to them for your listeners and viewers as platforms. So mRNA is a platform. Uh, viral vectors are a different platform. Uh, soluble proteins, recombinant proteins. Killed and activated is another platform. So we, we had uh, multiple platforms. There are three that are being actively done one is the, uh, the, uh, the mRNA, the other is viral vectors, where you take a virus, stick the gene of the spike protein so that it expresses itself, and then you get an, uh, an immune response when you inject that. The other is just taking a protein and inject it with an adjuvant. The reason that the novel technologies we used, that were very easy to just get out of the blocks and go with it, test, assess, but I explained to you the timetable. We went from a couple of days, bingo, into a vaccine, done. So if it works, which we believe it will, it will be a major advance of ease, of facility, of scale up, and ultimately of cost. We'll do it. It hasn't been proven the way some of the others have been by years and years of experience. So that's one of the things. If it works, which I hope it will, I think it will, people will be saying, wow, we have a red hot platform here. We're gonna start using that for a lot of other vaccines. The other ones that we have are the, the viral vector ones, the ones I described, be an adenovector, a vesicular stomatitis vector. That's another one that we've had some experience with, particularly with Ebola, in which it worked very well. 
And then there's the ones that have been used more commonly, which is the soluble proteins that you can make with recombinant DNA technology. So there's multiple platforms we're hoping, and I, I believe we'll be successful, I hope we are, that more than one of them will prove to be safe and effective. It'll be good for the effort, and it'll be good for the field of vaccinology, because it's really unprecedented that we have so many different platforms going on at the same time to determine safety and efficacy. Yeah. All right. So I, I think we're almost out of time. So I wanted to check in and see if there's anything else that you wanted to cover or uh, are there any other thoughts that you'd like to leave uh, this community with? Yeah, I, I just want to reiterate what I said before, Mark, and, and, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to say it, that we are all in this together. We are going to get through it. We will get through this difficult situation at, 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 at best. It's difficult. I mean, it's a very significant issue that we're dealing with right now. But we've all got to do it together. We're in it together. And since I, I know we're looking disproportionately to a lot of young people that are watching this, please assume the societal responsibility of being part of the solution and not part of the problem. Of course, we're going to get through it. We're going to get this under control in the southern states. And hopefully, we're not going to see these kind of surges so that we do get down to the baseline that we hope we would. Because once we're down to that baseline, Mark, it's going to be so much more easy when you open up the country, as it were, to put your clamps on when you get individual infections. They don't soar off the ceiling they stay clamped down. That's the message I want to get one last time. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Fauci. Um, I think I say this on behalf of millions of Americans um, who will watch this. Uh, we appreciate your leadership and your dedication uh, to helping us navigate this. Um, you, you have uh, a lot of people's confidence, we, and, and a lot of people um, out there continue to have faith in in, in science and want to make sure that this is led, that, that our response is led by, by science. So um, thank you for everything that you are doing um, in, in what are some, some trying circumstances. Um, and please stay healthy and, and good. And, um, and thank you to everyone uh, out there for tuning in today. I, I hope you all stay uh, good as well. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you, Mark. Give me, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be with you. I really appreciate it. Thanks.